Week 2, Day 4 Wilmington's Guide to the Bible, page 168 3. The Two Eagles Ezekiel 17, 1-21 The events mentioned in this parable narrate the international affairs of Judah, Babylon, and Egypt between 597 and 588 B.C. The figures involved are Jehoiachin, Zedekiah, and Nebuchadnezzar. For the recorded history of this period, see 2 Kings 24, 8-20, 2 Chronicles 36, 9-13, Jeremiah 37, and Jeremiah 52, 1-7. 4. The Tender Twig, Ezekiel 17, 22-24. A. God stated He would someday plant the finest and most tender twig of all upon Israel's highest mountain. Ezekiel 17, 22. B. This twig would grow into a noble tree, blessing all who came near it by its fruit and shade. Ezekiel 17, 23. C. Through all this, the entire world would know the plan and power of God. Ezekiel 17, 24. D. These verses without question introduce a messianic prophecy. See also Isaiah 2, 2 through 4, Micah 4, 1 through 4. The tender twig is the Messiah. Isaiah 11, 1. Isaiah 53, 2, Jeremiah 23, 5 through 6, Jeremiah 33, 15, Zechariah 6, 12, and Revelation 22, 16. And the high mountain is Mount Zion. See Psalm 2, 6. Page 492. 34. What is the meaning of the word incarnation? Here, definitions from several theologians will prove helpful. Capital letter A. The word incarnation means in flesh and denotes the act whereby the eternal Son of God took to Himself an additional nature, humanity, through the virgin birth. The result is that Christ remains forever unblemished deity, which He has had from eternity past, but he possesses true, sinless humanity in one person forever. See for reference John 1.14, Philippians 2, 7-8, and 1 Timothy 3.16. The virgin birth was the means whereby the incarnation took place and guaranteed the sinlessness of the Son of God. Paul ends Moody Handbook of Theology Page 222. Capital Letter B. In context of Christian theology, the act whereby the eternal Son of God, the second person of the Holy Trinity, without ceasing to be what He is, God the Son, took into union with Himself what He before that act did not possess, a human nature. And so He was and continues to be God and man in two distinct natures and one person forever. Westminster Shorter Catechism, Question 21. Scripture support for this doctrine is replete. Examples are John 1.14, Romans 1.3, Romans 8.3, Galatians 4.4, 4, Philippians 2.7-8, 1 Timothy 3.16, 1 John 4.2, and 2 John 1.7. Evangelical Dictionary of Theology, Grand Rapids, Michigan, Baker, 1984, page 555. See for reference also Ephesians 2.15, Colossians 1.21-22, 1 Peter 3.18, and 1 Peter 4.1. Capital letter C. This refers to the eternal Son of God's being enfleshed as Jesus of Nazareth. It refers to the time when, in man's finest hour, 
God the Son became man through the Virgin Mary and lived some 33 years in Palestine. It is the time when God, precisely through the Son, pitched his tent among us, John 1.14, when Christ counted equality with God not something to be held on to, but humbled himself, wore the form of a servant, and became obedient all the way to death on an ignominious Roman cross, Philippians 2.5-8. In what C. H. Dodd called the not-yet times of the Old Testament, God had spoken to us in diverse ways through prophets, priests, and kings, and in the last time span, the last salvific age, God spoke to us through His only begotten, eternally generated Son, John 1.18 and Hebrews 1.1 FF. Incarnation means that God was not content simply to think good thoughts about us, nor to help us while keeping a safe distance from us. It means that God visited us for our salvation in our sorry case, as the ancient Athanasius expressed it. Beacon Dictionary of Theology, Kansas City, Beacon Hill, 1983, page 279. The incarnation thus involved that amazing divine act whereby the omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient Son of God agreed to wrap around his eternal and invisible being, flesh and bone, and take upon himself a human nature, thus becoming a fleshly bridge between the sovereign God and sinful men. In a nutshell, the incarnation became the door through which deity would enter the house of humanity. Eugene Peterson aptly translates John 1.14 this way, the Word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. The Message Two thousand years ago in Bethlehem, when God became man, His new nature became permanent from that time on. Jesus will never cease to be known as the God-man and will always be known by the scars He received on Calvary's cross. This is called the perpetuity of the Incarnation. This belief is attested to by a number of passages. 1. He was recognized by these scars after his resurrection. John 20, 24 through 27. 2. He is now recognized by these scars in heaven. Revelation 5, 6. 3. He will be recognized by these scars at his second coming. Zechariah 12:10 and Revelation 1.7. Page 493. 35. What is the orthodox view of the Incarnation? John 1.14, Romans 8.3, 1 Timothy 3.16, and 1 John 4.2. Quotes from two distinguished theologians will suffice here. A. H. Strong says, In the one person, Jesus Christ, there are two natures a human nature and a divine nature, each in its completeness and integrity. And these two natures are organically and indissolvably united so that no third nature is formed thereby. Systematic Theology, page 73. Henry Thyssen says, The Council of Chalcedon in 451 established what has been the position of the Christian Church, there is one Jesus Christ, but he has two natures, the human and the divine. He is truly God and truly man, composed of a body and rational soul. He is consubstantial with the Father in his deity and consubstantial with man in his humanity, except for sin. In his deity, he was begotten of the Father before time and in his humanity, born of the Virgin Mary. The distinction between the natures is not diminished by their union, but the specific character of each nature is preserved, and they are united in one person. Jesus is not split or divided into two persons. He is one person, the Son of God. Lectures in Systematic Theology, Erdman's, page 208. 
36. What are some false views in regards to the Incarnation? At least five views of the Incarnation have been propagated. Capital letter A. Gnosticism. They denied the reality of Jesus' human nature and a physical incarnation. He was thus like a heavenly ghost, having only the appearance of flesh and bone. Capital letter B. Ebionitism. They denied the reality of Jesus' divine nature, claiming that Jesus so faithfully kept the Mosaic law that God chose him to be the Messiah. Capital letter C. Arianism. They held that Jesus was indeed in existence before Bethlehem as the firstborn of all creation, but not as God. In the Incarnation, Jesus entered a human body, taking the place of the human spirit. Thus, Jesus was neither fully God nor fully man. Capital letter D. Nestorianism. They believed two persons indwelled the body of Christ, the human person and the divine person. Thus, Jesus would have been a first-century Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Capital letter E. Eutychianism. They held an opposite view to the Nestorians, claiming that both natures, the human and the divine, mingled or fused together to create a third and totally different nature from the original two natures. 37. Did Jesus Christ officially become the Son of God at the Incarnation? No. Capital letter A. The relationships of the Trinity existed from eternity past. As early as Genesis 1, God is said to be in relation. An indication of this comes when God says, Let us create man in our image. This was the Creator God speaking to the Creator God with the intention of creating Adam and Eve after God's, plural, image. What this implies is that there is a plurality in the Godhead that is reflected in the earliest declarations of inspired Scripture. We only came to understand this fully when Jesus came to earth and taught us of his heavenly Father who sent him, and later of another comforter whom he would send, the Holy Spirit, John 14, 16. There was never a time when the Father existed alone without the Son or the Spirit. The Son is eternally begotten and the Spirit eternally proceeds from the Father and the Son. In human terms, sonship denotes two temporal ideas, relationship and origin. In relation to the Trinity, sonship implies an eternal relationship originating eternally in God the Father. Capital Letter B. Lewis Schaefer agrees with this assessment. It is evident that the father and son relationship sets forth only the features of emanation and manifestation and does not include the usual conception of derivation, inferiority, or distinction as to the time of beginning. It is probably that the terms father and son, as applied to the first and second persons in the Godhead, are somewhat anthropomorphic in character. That sublime and eternal relationship which existed between two persons is best expressed to human understanding in the terms of father and son, but wholly without implication that the two persons on the divine side are not equal in every particular. Systematic Theology, Volume 1, page 313 through 315. 38. When and where did the miracle of the Incarnation take place? Capital letter A. Positive Consideration. It did occur in Nazareth upon the announcement of Gabriel, Luke 1, 35. Stated another way, the miracle of the Incarnation was the supernatural conception of the body of Jesus within the womb of Mary without the aid of a human father. Capital letter B. Negative consideration. It did not occur in Bethlehem at the birth of Jesus. In fact, to the contrary, 
For had there been a medical doctor present to assist in the birth of Jesus, but not knowing the background of the event, he would have encountered nothing unusual in the delivery process itself. 39. What does the term hypostatic union mean? It is a Greek word meaning subsistence, referring to Jesus' divine and human natures. In essence, it is a theological truth affirming that Jesus Christ, since his incarnation, has been, is now, and ever shall be 100% God, 100% man, 100% of the time. Capital letter A. Paul ends emphasizes this perfect unity. The hypostatic union may be defined as the second person. The pre-incarnate Christ came and took to himself a human nature and remains forever undiminished deity and true humanity united in one person forever. When Christ came, a person came, not just a nature. He took on an additional nature, a human nature. He did not simply dwell in a human person. The result of the union of the two natures is the theanthropic person, the God-man. Moody Handbook of Theology, page 227. Capital Letter B. Robert Leitner discusses the eternality and necessity of this union. To deny either the undiminished deity or the perfect humanity of Christ is to put oneself outside the pale of orthodoxy. Equally as essential to orthodox theology is the belief that these two are inseparable and will remain eternally united in the person of Christ. The hypostatic union is the theological description of this and refers to the two hypostases, or natures, forming the one person of Christ. Apart from this union, Christ could not have been mediator between God and man. Evangelical Theology, page 81. Page 494, capital letter C. Charles Ryrie explores the paradoxical actions of a divine and human person. This simply means that the attributes of both natures belong to the one person without mixing the natures or dividing the person. Practically speaking, it is the basis for Christ being seen to be weak yet omnipotent, ignorant yet omniscient, limited yet infinite. I have said that attributes cannot be transferred from one nature to the other. To do so would change the mix of the complex of attributes and thus the nature. If infinity can be transferred to humanity, then deity loses infinity and is no longer full deity. However, attributes of both natures must be expressed through the one person. Thus the person can seem to transfer back and forth from the expression of one or the other natures though the attributes themselves must remain as a part of whichever nature they properly belong to. Thus theologians have developed a system to classify the actions of the person of Christ with respect to origination of the action. Whatever help such a classification may give, it seems more important to remember that the person does whatever he does revealing whatever attribute of whichever nature he reveals. Basic Theology, page 247.